leave it there. I was down away the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. Praise the Lord. This is Pastor James A. Duncans, Senior Pastor of the Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join in with us to check out our worship service and to be a part of the fantastic spirit-filled worship here at Shiloh Baptist Church. We are a kingdom building people. Our vision statement says that we build the kingdom of God through faithful worship to God and service to our fellow man. You can become a part of this church. You can be a part of this worship. We're just excited that you enjoy, that you joined us today and you will enjoy what you're hearing. Check out our website, check out our YouTube channel, check out our Facebook and make sure you tune in to Shiloh Baptist Churches. Org. Again, this is Pastor Duncans. Enjoy this worship. Let it fill your soul. God bless you. Good morning. Welcome to Shiloh Baptist Church. I'm Minister Richard Foreman. I'm one of the ministers here. I'm here to invite you this morning just to come in and join us in this morning worship service. I have a passage of scripture that is laid on my heart. I'm going to share with you. Come out of Lamentations, the third chapter. It's going to be 22nd verse to the 26th. Reads, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, save my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the souls that seek in him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait. For the salvation of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God praise for this day the Lord has made. And we are to rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know the Lord is asking me to do for this morning, whatever time it is, these words. Hallelujah. Come on, what's the name of the Lord? Yes, Lord.
Good morning, and as you can see, the praise team is on fire, and we have come this morning to give God some praise. I am Reverend Dr. James Duncan's here at Shiloh Baptist Church, and I want to tell you, just like some of you, we have learned to move and groove in this COVID-19 season. What the devil meant for our evil, God is turning around for our good. There's some great things happening, guys. There's some connections being made, some communication being made. I'm so excited about the worship that's going on. You know what I never do? We have been so, you know, trying to get into our technology and bring you a great worship service because we know that this is what God has given to us for so that we can make sure the word of God has never stopped. But I want to give a shout out to our tech team. You guys do not know how good it is when these folks just give up their time. We got a sound man in the back. When I say some names, you guys don't know. But I'm giving a shout out because I want them to know Pastor appreciates them. I love my grace team. I love my musicians. But these sound guys, these text guys, every week, they are doing it better and better and better. And I praise God for them. I also want you to know just a couple of quick things going on at the church that you can tune into. Please go to our YouTube channel. Listen, it's Shiloh Baptist 2. Shiloh Baptist T-W-O. Please go to our YouTube channel and just prescribe. I want you to actually subscribe. Excuse me. Yeah, prescribe. Subscribe and make sure you become a part. We're looking to get over five, 600 uh, subscriptions to our channel. We're slowly building up. If you see some mistakes, please excuse us. We're doing the best we can, but every week we try to bring you better and better and better worship. And I also want to give a shout out to all of the Shiloh folks. You guys know we got some of our senior saints. I don't even want to call them senior saints. Our teenagers. These guys are getting on Facebook, getting on Zoom, going into conferences. I am so excited. The devil thought he could slow down the word of God. We're just getting back. I have a word for you, coming to you. Right after this, uh, we're going to bring the word of God. You guys get ready. I need to say this because I'm not coming back again. You know how to give offering. We don't uh, beg or we don't conjole around here. All we tell you is check us out. It's no secret of the stuff that we're doing here. We're making sure, as I tell you every week, one of the main reasons we're getting right now, another area we're getting into, you need to watch this. We're trying to make sure that people's mental health is better. Uh, we have our Celebrate Recovery, so we have actually classes going on. So when people now are in this lockdown position, some of the fears and some of the latent uh, mental problems just seem to come back. So we're ministering there. So if you know someone, go to our website, tell them to tune in. We will reach out and help them. Are you ready for the word? All right, let's go to the word of God. We are going right into the word of God. I know there is Holy Ghost anticipation. So I want you to go with me to a very classic but powerful passage of scripture. Go to John's Gospel and navigate to the 11th chapter. I know some of you already know where I'm going, and I want you to go to John's Gospel, the Gospel according to John, chapter 11. I will be reading from an NIV version of the Bible. Uh, when you're ready, just say yeah, amen. Again, you know every week I get that amen timing in my head. I got you. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Come on, join me in a word of prayer. Father God, again, by your own power, your own care, we're asking that you would bless this word today. There's someone out there that needs the word of God. Let them know they're stepping into a Holy Ghost zone. They're stepping into a place where they can contact you and allow your word to get in their heart and bless them to the fullest. Lord, we thank you today for everything that's going to be said and done. Have your way in this place. Take me out of the way so you can get your glory. Amen. If you're following me, what a word, what a word I have for you today. 
The title of this message, for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, is entitled, You Let Me Out. You Let Me Out. One more time, in case somebody still, you know, you got the old school thing going on when you take notes. You Let Me Out. One of the biggest blessings in my life is that I grew up in a Christian home. I was not always acting like a Christian, but I grew up in a Christian home. And the benefit was we went to church, we went to Sunday school, we went to church every Sunday, Sunday school, choir rehearsal. So I did have some good home training. One of the other things, and all of you that went to church like me understand, you did not live in your parents' house for free. Come on, somebody. When I grew up, you didn't live in your parents' house for free. You know how you paid for your stay? You had to do what we used to call back then, chores. You had to make sure you cleaned something. Took the trash out, wiped the car, made the bed. Whatever it was, you did chores. And so you learned how to get a work, work ethic. And when I got older, I found out that I had to get a job. That's another thing. You didn't just live in a house and the school was out in the summertime. You went and got a job. I had so many jobs by the time I got to college, so many jobs by the time I uh, got married that I, I could work and do whatever I needed to do. I had a work ethic. Something is missing. I'm not getting on that right now because that's not what we're talking about. But I need you to understand how I'm leading into what happened to me a few weeks ago. And I had to give you that background so you understand. But just a few weeks ago, I decided to go to the Wild Wild Ground, down the street from my house, pick up some things. I bought a sandwich. Back popcorn and some soda, and I picked up a couple other things. And I remember there was a long line because of social distancing, so I had to stand this long line. When I finally made it to the counter, guess what, y'all? I did not have a dime. I'm sitting there, I'm so embarrassed. I looked at the lady, and she was not a smiling cashier. She looked up at me, I said, Miss, I don't have any money. She immediately, in a very aggressive manner, grabbed my stuff, pushed it to the side. I said, well, I live 10 minutes down the road. It'll take me 10 minutes to go back home, and I'll come back with money. She didn't even say a word to me. She cut her eye at me, and then she waved the next person on in line. So I went on out the store in a kind of sheepish way. Man, I gunned the car and got our way home. When I got home, I got my money, sped back to the store. When I got in there, do you know what happened? That's right. She had put all my stuff back. They had thrown the sandwich in the trash. I don't know what they did. I had to go through the process of getting all of that stuff over again. And when I got to the register, I had some ones and a 20 and a 50. I made sure she knew who I was. I said, <laughs> Uh, my stuff, and she looked, she was a little embarrassed. Yes, she was, but she looked at me, because I did come back, like I said, and she said, $12.80. Yes, right, y'all know what I did? I gave her the 50. <laughs> like, like, I ain't got no money, I gave her that 50. And so, I, 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 I found myself leaving the store, know what was going on, and something else happened about, well, last week, I went down to the church, and when I was leaving my house to go to the church, the gas light came on in the car. Um, I said, I'll get gas later, made it to the church, worked at the church all day, left the church, gas light on again, didn't see it until I got almost home, poured into the driveway, I'll get gas tomorrow. Didn't get gas. Next morning I got up, I had a conference with some preachers, I had to eat to the church by 10 o'clock. When I pulled into the church, I noticed that, I mean, as I was driving to the church, I hadn't gotten gas, back and forth to the church, all of a sudden that gas light started hollering at me. They start speaking, I'm on empty, I'm on empty. I was late for my conference, I had to go past the church, and I drove to the nearest gas station, holding my breath, and driving as slow as I could. You say, Pastor, where are you going? What does this got to say? Here's what it is. If my money could talk, Come on. it would say, you decide to go to the store. You make plans to buy all of this stuff. You get in line to pay for stuff, but you never included me in your calculations. You take me for granted. I know what you said. I always got money. That's because I've been dependable, but you didn't even leave me in your plans. The money is saying, how are you going to pay for something when you didn't think you need me? You just forgot about me, and you did not include me in the equation, and you had to do something else. If my gas could talk, I'm going somewhere, y'all. My gas would say, oh, you want to ride, huh? You want to drive somewhere? 
Well, you gotta put some gas in the car. You can't keep going back and forth and ignore me. You know why you ignore me? Because I'm always there. You know why you ignore me? Because I'm always dependable. But you forgot to include me in your calculation. You decided to take me for granted. Well, that's what Jesus is talking about. If you think I'm still talking about gas, if you think I'm still talking about money, I done shifted over to our relationship with the Lord. The Lord said, take me for granted. You know me, but you take me for granted. You know me, but you never calculate me in your plans. You know me, and you know what you do? You leave me out until trouble comes. You know what happened? When I found out I didn't have any money, money became the most important thing in my life. When I found out I didn't have any gas, nothing else mattered but gas. And when we get to the point that we have left God out, and we get there, all of a sudden God becomes the most important thing in our life. That's the principle in this text today. Jesus is telling Mary and Martha, I know Lazarus is dead. I know that you're sad. But you have already figured out that I can't do anything. You're walking around as if I can't come in here now and get the power enough to lift Lazarus up, to resuscitate Lazarus. You act like everything is limited by your limitations. You know what you did? You went to the gravesite, Lazarus died, and you left me out of the equation. I was coming, and you didn't even think about me. In the 32nd verse of this chapter, we find out that it says, and when Mary saw Jesus coming, watch this, y'all. It says she ran, fell at his feet, and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. If I would have been there, have you forgot who I am? Have you forgot about my power? You forgot I got power to fix it now? Have you forgot that I can turn things around even now? Have you forgotten there is nothing out of my reach? Isn't it something? They have made up their mind that God couldn't do anything. He was still on his way. And they told Jesus, if you would have been there. Here is what I need you to understand about the power of God and what we're going to talk about now. God said, don't leave me out. Don't act like you don't need me. And don't get so hopeless in this COVID season. In the time you let your circumstances and your troubles lead you away from my power. You act like this is the end. Who told you it was over? Who told you I can't do anything now? I'm getting excited now because here is what I figured out when I watched this story. I saw something I had never seen before. There's a whole lot of us saying that just count. God out. And in the Bible right now, God tells us many times, don't count me out. Don't get hopeless. Don't leave me out of your plans. What do I mean? He said, don't leave me out. Call on. Yes. Yes. Listen to the prophet Jeremiah. 33 and 33 and verse 3. Here's what he said. Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you've never seen before. Did you hear what God said? Quit leaving him out and start calling on him. Instead of leaving him out, trust him. Come on, a very familiar pastor scripture. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, leading not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. It's never over when there's a God on your side. He said, instead of leaving me out, call on me. Instead of leaving me out, trust me. Watch this one. And instead of leaving me out, wait on me. What do you mean, wait on me? Here's what he said, uh, Psalms 46, verse 10. Every now and then, you got to do this. If you're a powerful saint, if you know the God that I know, here's what he told you what the psalmist said to do in verse 10. Stand still and see. Come on, did you get that? You're not doing any work. All you're doing is standing your ground. Anybody standing out there today that believe that I just stand still, the same God that delivered me last time is the God that's going to bring me out this time. I know what God is telling you. This text is going to teach us some principles that are going to bless you. You know the story. You know the story. Uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were friends of Jesus. If anybody should have not left him out, Mary and Martha and Lazarus should have not left him out. What do I mean by that? If you go into the Synoptic Gospels, you will find out that this story is not in any of the Synoptic Gospels, but in John's Gospel here, it tells that friendship that Mary and Martha had with Jesus Christ. 
The only other gospel where there's a prominent story that we all know is in Luke's gospel chapter 10. You remember when Jesus was coming back with his disciples and he sent word to Mary and Martha that I'm going to be stopping by for a visit. Jesus was so close with Mary and Martha. He could stop by for a visit just by sending a notice. He could drop by the house. That's what you call a friend. And if you look at the text, it says Jesus, the one who you love, is sick. He was their friend. And he loved them. Here's what I need you to shout about. Friendship with Jesus equals love. Love with Jesus equals friendship. And if Jesus loves you, that means he's your friend. You may not be excited about that, but there is something about having power and friendship with Jesus Christ. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean this. If you have a friend, a friend stop by to see about you. A friend not only stops by to check you out, a friend will use their resources to help you out. How many know God got un unnumerable resources? He got uncountable resources, immeasurable resources. So if Jesus is your friend, we get that old church feeling on the inside. Now you know what our forefathers were saying. There's a good old Baptist hymn. I know you Methodist folks sang it too. I know holiness folks sang it too. But there's a Baptist hymn where I grew up in the Baptist church. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, can somebody say, oh, our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. I need you to know the context of that hymn. The context was Joseph Scryer, a preacher, had actually written that to help his ailing mother. All he's saying is when you know Jesus is your friend, there's no reason you should go to hopeless. Oh, I know somebody just struck that right now. You can't go to hopeless when you got Jesus. If nobody else is around, he won't walk out on you because that's the kind of friend that he is. I'm getting excited about it because when Jesus is your friend, here's what they did. It says that Mary should have known and Martha should have known out of the love Jesus had for them that he would never let them down. Did you hear the text say that that Mary was the same Mary? that sat at the house and washed Jesus' feet with her hair, with her tears, and dried them with her hair. What am I saying? Mary had been intimate with God. Not you, Mary. Well, don't pick on Mary, because there's some of us out here now. You have put a smile on your face since trouble came. You have not looked up to God since trouble came. You've been on that wishy-washy kind of faith when you got to realize that I can't leave God out of my plans. And here's how the rest of the story goes. When Jesus finally gets there, uh -huh. they find him no faith. Nope. Hopeless. Jesus. All of them that he had loved. No faith and hopeless. And he found himself in a situation where he could not believe that they left him out of the calculation. Mm -hmm. They were telling him, he just said, I'm going to raise Lazarus up. And so the end of the story is he raised him up. Mm -hmm. They heard he was sick, sent for Jesus, he went, they had no faith, raised him up. That's the end of the story. But now let me give you some principles. <laughs> let me tell you what the story says so you see what God wants us to glean out of this text. So I want you to write this down. I always like to tell you where I'm going because I found something in here that blessed me to the point that it, this, it took all of my fears and all of my struggles out of my life because I realized something. I got a God that I can always include in my plans. And even when I don't include him, he includes me. Can you write this down? The first reason for you never to get to the point that you forget about God and get to the point of hope is, is remember, God knows what he's doing. Amen. Please write it down. God knows when you don't even know what God's doing. God, that thing messed me up because God is saying, I know what I'm doing. The second thing is, God will show up. He may not show up when you want him to. You know, we got the old cliche, he's an on-time God, but here's what I want you to know. He will show up. Not only will God know what he's doing, not only will God show up, here's the best part. He will fix it. Very simple. God knows what he's doing. God will show up. God will fix it. Let's look at this text and see how God blessed Mary and Martha and Lazarus and can bless us with an understanding. That first verse said, now there was a man named Lazarus. He was sick unto death from the village of Bethany. And it said that, they said the one that you love is sick. How do we know God knows what he's doing? 
Because the text tells us, first of all, I need to work with that for a minute. God knows what he's doing when you don't. Come on, man. God sees past what you can see. You know, the Bible tells us his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. You're sitting down there having a hissy fit because you can't think of a way out. And God is up in glory telling you that I know already what I'm doing. The first thing this text tells us is if you sent for me, if you're a part of me, why can't you trust me? Come on, if you, if you sit for me, if you know you asked me to show up, why in the world won't you believe that I am coming and on my way? Here's what you need to know about God knows what he's doing. He never gets flustered. He never gets confused. He's never wondering what the next step is. He's already plotted out what he is. How do you know that, Pastor? Because the text says, while they're sitting there worried, Jesus pronounced, as soon as the man came, get the picture, somebody came with a message, Lazarus was sick. Jesus had never seen him. But since God already knows what's going on in our life, the first thing Jesus said is, this sickness is not unto death. How did he know that? Because he had already made his mind up to heal you. Sometimes you got to grab the promise in God's word and say, you know what, Lord? Somebody said that I was sick and I couldn't get well, but your word says you are a healer. Somebody told me that we're not going to make it through the winter, but your word says you will supply my needs. Somebody told me that no matter how hard I pray, nothing will change. But I heard you say that the prayers of a righteous man will avail much. All I'm telling you is God knows. What he's doing. How do I know? First thing he said, this sickness is not unto death. You wasted a whole lot of time worrying. Second thing in this text, he said, watch this. He said, but it's for the glory of God. Let me explain the glory of God to you so you can have a shout. Here's the glory of God. The glory of God is God blesses us with whatever we need so that he can, we can have a testimony and our testimony glorifies him. He provides, he loves, he protects, so that we will stand up and tell somebody about how good he is. But I need you to know, his motivation is not so he can get some glory. Are you kidding me? The stars declare the glory of God. The sun declares the glory of God. Nature declares the glory of God. How many bugs crawling around your house and how many insects and how many animals out there declare the glory of God? Man can't even figure stuff out. But God said, I'm not getting glory for myself. Here's what he said. I, when I want you to glorify me, when you testify about who, how good I've been, here is what you just said to me. God, watch this shot. You take my problem over and I will enjoy the blessing. Here's what God said. I'm going to take ownership of your deliverance. All you got to do is be ready for the shout. Be ready for the deliverance. He said, but you got to make sure you open your mouth. What am I talking about? It's right in the word of God. Listen to the word of God. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When you do that, you're giving God glory, but you're also getting a blessing because you're getting your redemption that's in your life. Anybody ever had the redemption of God? Just pour out of your body. And you found yourself there shouting, saying, what a good God I serve. Because when you are redeemed, there is nothing like it. There is nothing like knowing that you are redeemed. So the glory of God is he protects us because he knows what he's doing. Can I illustrate what had happened? This just happened to me this week. Me and my wife were going to a funeral. It was the first time I was preaching a funeral inside of a funeral home. Y'all gotta catch this. And as we were going down the road, we had to go up to Palmyra, which was some 40, 45 miles from where we are. And I got on 55. And many of you know, when you get on 55, the speed limit is 65. But if you're a seasoned driver like me, you drive 75. Now, nobody wants to drive the speed limit. As a matter of fact, if you see me on the road and you want to drive the speed limit, please get out of my way. Nobody drives the speed limit when you know how to drive. Anyway, I was flying down the road. Then I had to go over to Route 42. Then I had to go to Route 130. And when I got there, I was so fast. We were so far ahead of time. My wife and I said, we're going to stop at Dunkin' Donuts and get us some coffee. I pulled in. We got our, our little coffee and our little snacks. I was pulling out to go. And just as I pulled back, trying to pull on the road to 130, the tire blew out. I went about a few hundred yards and I had to pull into the nearest driveway. Pulled the car there, had Marcia call 
The funeral director said, look, your pastor here, I gotta preach. You need to come get us. We were only four miles away. He came and picked us up, took us there. When we got there, he said, not only will I, I'm gonna take you back, but I'll make sure that you get a ride back to your car and I'll stay there with you till you get it fixed. Well, I preached the funeral. He used to say we got there. I had spotted a gas station across the street. So I told him, yeah, take me over to that gas station. The bay is open. Watch this. So I said, uh, sir, can you fix the car? My car is parked right across the street there on the other side of the divider. He said, no, no, no. Did you look? Where you pulled in at, that's called Beacon Auto. They do repairs right over there. You would pull into a place that does repair. I didn't know that. So I went around the corner, got back over there. The lady said, sure, we'll fix it. The lady not only fixed it, they were not only nice to us, they came out, fixed it, and did not charge us any money for fixing it. Not only did he didn't charge us any money for fixing it, we were going to give him a tip. And the funeral director said, no, I'll give him the tip. So we got our car fixed. We got back in the road, clothes still pressed and clean. We got on the road, and my wife said something that messed me up. She said, honey, I am so glad that tire didn't blow out when we were all 55. She got me to thinking, wait a minute, not only did God protect me with my crazy self driving 75 and 65, made sure the tire didn't blow out so after we pulled out of Dunkin' Donuts, then he pulled me into an auto store, then he made sure there was somebody that changed the tire, then he made sure it wouldn't cost me nothing, and he put me back on my way. Can you say God will protect you? Is there anybody that knows? That is not an accident. That comes from a good God who makes a way out of no way. Turn stuff around. So all I need you to know is God knows what he's doing. I didn't know why. I could have man, I'm having a flat tire. Why am I having a flat tire trying to preach a funeral? But I trusted in God. God knows what he's doing. Yes, he does. Every time. Everything through prayer. How else do I know God knows what he's doing? It's right there in the text. I love this. He looked at them and said, I stayed two more days. You did what, God? I wanted you to come down. The powerful thing is, he said, the, the way I know that he knows what he's doing, not only does he uh, say the sickness down to death, he can prophesy. Not only can um, he tell us that, you know, he will protect us and he guide us. Watch this. Here's us what he said. He stayed two more days. Now watch why he did it. Don't miss it. The next verse says, he told them in verse 9, there are 12 hours in a day. Because they told Jesus when he said, let's go to Judea so that we can go help Lazarus. He said to them, they said to him, Master, they want to stone you there. He said, well, here's what happens. I have to keep focus on my work. Okay, I didn't explain it well because you missed it. Here's what he's saying. There's going to be some times in my life as Jesus, I got to do what God said. And as long as I stay focused on God, things will always go the right way. Here's what he's telling us. Our problem is when the problem comes, we focus on the problem and lose focus on God. You thought about that problem all night long. You thought about that problem last week. You thought about that problem all day. But when are you going to think about the goodness of the Lord? Jesus said, I know they're trying to stone me, but I got a God who can protect me. So he stayed two more days. But then the text tells us why he stayed. Not only for the focus, he said, I'm glad that Lazarus died so that I can show you my power. Here's what he said. He said, because he told them, well, Lazarus is sleeping. They misunderstood him. He said, Lazarus is sleeping. You got to go there and help him out. And then he said, let me explain this to you guys. Lazarus is dead. God is saying, because you're with me does not exempt you from going through struggles. But if you stay focused, here's what God does. He sets us up for a miracle. He puts us in a position that nothing that we can do is going to bless us. We need a miracle from God. You know what he was doing right here? He could have went and got Lazarus, but he decided, I'm going to get you in a place where all you can do is call on me. I'm going to get you to the place where you better get on your knees. I'm going to get you to the place that you're going to see the miracle working power of God. Here's what he said. He said, a miracle is when I do something in this realm that cannot be explained by all the knowledge in this realm, but I do it so I can bless you. Many of us in here will say, I don't know about Lazarus, but here's what I know. I know I received a miracle. Are there any other people that can tell you it's a miracle that I am still here? 
It's a miracle with all that I've been through that I'm still standing. Come on, somebody. It's a miracle that I am still saying. It is a miracle that I have made it through the tragedies. But here's what happens. If I stay focused, I realize God did it for my benefit. Now, I want you to see something before I go to my second point. In that 16th verse, it says, then when Jesus said, let's go to Judea, guess who it was that said, let's go with it? You guys don't know believe this. It was doubting Thomas. That's right. It was Thomas who had doubted Jesus. Now, this is just an aside, but I need you to know this because sometimes in church, there's folk that think they're more holy than other people. There's people that think they got more faith than everybody else. But can I help you out? All of us are going to get to a crisis of faith. Here, Thomas was the one who said, let's go with Jesus. He was ready to die. All I'm showing you is nobody's going to have it good all the time, but just be able to stand when you come to your moment of faith and know that God is with you. Okay, so we found out that he knows what he's doing. Watch this. And God will come. Look at verse 17. When he arrived in Lazarus, in, in uh, Bethany, Lazarus had already been dead for four days. Now when they told Jesus Lazarus was dying, that was two days, then he stayed there two more days. So now we found out it's four days that he did not come. Here's what you need to understand about this part of the text. I want to bless somebody. God's timing is for you to be blessed. God's timing. Think about something. God's timing is not our timing. You got to realize that God's timing is that God does not show up when we think he should. He comes when he knows he should. And we call that a divine delay. Can I help somebody out? If God has not shown up with your blessing, it does not mean he has denied it. It means that he's making you an extra special blessing. How do I know that? It's in the word of God. I didn't just make that up. What I'm telling you is we wish God would come up and we wish God's timing was he would do stuff before I get in trouble. He would do stuff before I die, before I get sick, before I get hurt. But the text tells us, watch this, that God's timing is right on time so that God can keep us in his plan and that we can get the blessing of the Lord. What do I mean by that? When you look at God's timing, and here's the blessing of this, Daniel probably said, I wish God would have shown up before I went to the line then. Uh, Job probably said, Lord, why did you show up before I lost everything? Or before I got all these boils on my body? God said, I didn't show up then because I was doing something greater for you. Look what happened. Daniel, God came down, shut the mouths of the lions. Watch this. And when Daniel came out of the den, he had a better position than he had when he went in the den. Not only that, Job got double for everything he went through. Now, if God had taken Job on his timing and went with Job's timing, he would have never got delivered. So you need to understand that Lazarus had been dead four days, and Jesus did four days on purpose. Let me explain to you again. Come on, let me teach you a little Bible. That the Jews had a superstition back then that if your body had been dead more than three days, your spirit had left the body. So there's no way God could resuscitate you when your spirit has left the body. Jesus waited till it was the fourth day so he could show them the power of God. God said, my timing is better than anybody else's timing. Matter of fact, the Jews even now want the body in the ground before 24 hours. But here's what God said. What you need to know is you can trust my timing. How can I trust your timing, God? Well, because God created time. Genesis 1 tells us in the beginning was God. He created the heaven and earth. So God created time. Also, God works in eternal time. What do I mean? The psalmist in Psalms 90 said, Lord, from all generations, you have been our dwelling place before the earth was formed forever thou art God. God said, I'm doing some stuff in your life that's going to make your life better eternally. You ought to have a shout down here because I'm a God that does eternal time. And another reason you can trust God's time because God's timing gives you strength. What do you mean God's timing gives me strength? Because Isaiah said in Isaiah 40 verse 31, they that wait <laughs> on the Lord shall renew their strength. Here's what God is saying. If you're waiting on me, you got some joy coming. If you're waiting on me, you got a big blessing coming. If you're waiting on me, you got something.
are coming that you've never seen before. All I'm saying is God hasn't come yet. A divine delay does not mean God's not coming. It means God's in glory making something special for you. Look what happened here on Martha. Jesus shows up. Now you know Martha is rambunctious. Martha is the one when Jesus got to the house. Mary, you're following me. I want you to follow in verse 21. Mary had been sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha had been running around all anxious, all nearly really trying to figure out what's going on. So when Jesus pulled up, who do you think was the first one out the house? Oh, ran folks is Martha. Martha ran out the house and said, Lord, I this. Now, Jesus knew his disciples didn't trust him. That's why he had to tell them Lazarus is dead. Here's the part that hurts. This is just the text. He found out that Martha, this is the first time he's finding out Martha didn't believe in him. He said, what? Martha said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. This is important. Don't miss it. Martha is like so many saints. You know God's got power. You know God has already been faithful in your past. Here's the problem. You counted God out because you counted you out. Come on, somebody. I just said something. When you count yourself out, that's when you count God out. When you count yourself out, see what God is saying is, you're my arms, you're my legs, it's your faith. If you count yourself out, I can't do nothing. I showed up and you still didn't believe. I showed up with your deliverance, but you had already said that you weren't getting it. You had gotten yourself so messed up. You had ran ahead of yourself that you had gotten so messed up, you thought, Lord, I know God can't do it. You saw God do it for other people. You let, you let all kinds of circumstances now up in your life. And God is saying, the reason you count me out is first you count yourself out. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul locked in a prison. Been whipped and taken from prison to prison, writing the Bible. Had to give us that verse so every now and then we could encourage yourself. He said, I can do in prison all things. Yes, some of y'all got to get that. Look, come on, I know I'm preaching to you, but every now and then you got to get somewhere and get that thing on your own to tell yourself, I can get out of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, come on, let me give you some power to back it up. David in Ziglag. Oh. I need you to understand that. Ziglag in the Bible was first seen in the book of Joshua. Ziglag was the place that David ran to when uh, he was running from Saul. He ran to Ziglag, and he went over to King Achish of the Philistines, and then King Achish gave David Ziglag to live in. Now, watch David. All kind of men, this is where David got his mighty men from, broken, bruised, people who had had struggles and troubles in life. They got themselves into Ziglag, and they were David's men. They followed David around. And David now is still going out from Ziglag. Don't watch the drama. He's on, he's making hits and raids and, and he's living to beat the same people he's living with. Almost like an action movie. And then all of a sudden, one day he goes to fight with the Philistines, him and his men, they really weren't doing any fighting. But the king's men, King David's men said, hey, we don't want David with us. That's the David that said killed thousands. That's the David that killed a lot. We don't want him with us. They sent David back. But when David got back to Ziglag, Amalekites, Amalekites, excuse me, had gone there and raided, burned his houses, stole his children, stole their wives, and the men talk about stoning David. I'm talking about learning, learning how to understand how life goes up and down. Watch this. And the men that David were with said, we ought to stone you. And the Bible tells us David walked off. Can you see it? I can see it. He walked off to a spot. He could have got to that spot and started oh, lying. Lord, I've been chased by and stand by Saul. Uh, I've been living with the Philistines. You see, I've still been doing your will. Lord, look what's going on in my life. Sound like some of y'all don't. Lord, things just keep getting worse. He didn't do that. No, he didn't. At his lowest gone. Wives gone. Children gone. Houses burned. No country to live in. He looked up and the Bible tells us David encouraged himself in the Lord. Some of y'all need to do that. You ought to step in front of a mirror and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You ought to step up and say, if my God is for me, who can be against me? You ought to say, devil, take your best shot. I got a God on my side. David encouraged himself in the Lord. David proved that God 
if you don't count yourself out. Am I talking to somebody today? Yes, sir. Don't count yourself out. Come on, Pastor. God is still on your side. Watch this. Here comes Mary. I would say he went a little further. Mary was a little different. When he got to Mary, Mary came out, and the Bible tells us that all the other people, see, in biblical times, there was a funeral dirge, meaning there was a, a, a community that would come, and they would actually mourn with you. All of those mourners came with Mary. So when Mary came, she brought everybody. Jesus had already heard from Martha. Then he got there, Mary fell on her knees, and Mary said, Lord, if you would have been there. Uh -huh. And that's when the Bible tells us something. Please go with me. That you only see once. It may have happened another time. But when Mary said it, Mary heard it. This was the Mary he saw at his feet. This was the Mary he told her, you prepared my burial. Mm -hmm. I know Martha might not have faith in me, but you have faith in me, don't you? Mary. He said, well, Mary, don't you know who I am? I'm the resurrection and life. And same thing he told Martha. And Mary said, yes, I know he'll live again in the resurrection. And the Bible says something I want you to see. The Bible says, Jesus wept. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. There's some of you out there. You don't have the Mary thing going on. You don't lose your spirit, but you break God's heart. Because there's times when you call on God. And he made special trips to get to your house. There's nights when you couldn't sleep. God sent extra angels down to be with you. There's moments when the devil said he's going to take you out. And you knew it. And Jesus cried. Because some of us, he loves so much. He put so much in that we can break his heart. And some of us don't think God's heart can be broken. I mean, if I could give Jesus some anthropomorphic features, that's human characteristics, and if I could tell you about the hypostatic union of Christ, what's the hypostatic union? He is just as much God as he is man. And we found out that he wept. There was this young girl. She would break her feet. She'd go out, drink, party, wouldn't listen to her parents. She'd come home, her dad would yell at her, ground her. And so one of these weeks when she was coming back from all of her parties, she happened to be sneaking in the house. And she snuck past her parents' room and saw or heard something that blew her mind. Her father was saying these words, I just love her so much. And he was crying. She never heard her father cry. He said, and I just don't want her to get hurt. And then he put his head in his wife's arms and just cried over his daughter. The daughter ran into the room. The next weekend, they were out partying. And the gang got together and said, let's go over to this restaurant and bar over here. She said, my parents don't like it me to be there. Y'all need to take me home. So one of the girls got sarcastic and said, oh, you're just afraid your dad gonna hurt you. She said, uh-uh. I'm afraid I might hurt my dad. Some of you ought to stand straight so you don't hurt your father. Mama, come on now. God has been too good for you to keep letting him down. Yes. The Bible says Jesus Last point. God knows what he's doing. God knows he will come in his time. It will be the right time. And finally, he will fix it. Look at the text. The Bible says then, Jesus looked, and they said, oh, look how I love them. And the Bible said, Jesus looked, and they, and the text says, he sighed one more time. If I could use my Holy Ghost imagination, that sigh, of him doing that one more time was no longer a sigh of crying. Here's what it was, and here's the shout. It was a sigh where Jesus just said, I forgive you. I believe Jesus just sucked up and said, you my child, I know you've done me wrong, but I'm going to bless you anyhow. He mourned, and he said, he said, how do I know that's right? Because then he said, take me to the body. And when they took him to the body, they said, move the stone. First of all, I need you to know something. You should be shouting because even though you don't trust him, he will bless you in spite of you trusting him. That's why you should 
never leave him out. Secondly, he will do what he said he was going to do. He said, move the stone. They said, by now, he stinketh. But he said, move the stone. And they moved the stone out of the way. Here's what I want you to know. No matter if it's dead, he can bring it back to life. No matter if they said it's over, he can bring it back to life. Even if they tell you the dream won't work. He will make it work. He said, move the stone. Now, they were still protesting. By now, he stinks. God said, you, don't, you haven't figured it out yet. Your life may stink. You got me. Jesus. And then finally, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Yes, sir. Now, everybody goes into this big dramatic thing telling about Lazarus, come forth. And I can do all that, but here's what I want you to know. Somebody said, well, if he hadn't called Lazarus because if he did, he would have called everybody who came forth. Maybe that's true, but this is how I like to look at it. I like to look at that God shows up, and there can be a thousand people in the room, but what God has for me is for me. So I believe he purposed on giving Lazarus his blessing, because Lazarus was who he came for. And he looked at Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And then he broke off the dead clothes. I need to back up as I go to tell you this. Before he did, he looked up at his father and said, Father, I thank you come on, man. that you will now come and help me mm -hmm. for the sake of these people standing here. Yes, yes. Oh, I hope you got this whole text. Don't leave God out. You can't do anything with him. He said, don't leave me out. I'm going to bless you anyhow. I'm going to forgive you anyhow. And I'm coming to do what I got to do. I just hope I find you still looking for me. When you get here. Can I have a head down? Thank you. Don't leave me out. Don't leave me out. I want to be a part of every one of your plans. I want to dry the tears in your eyes. I want to hold you when the world drops you. Don't leave me out. I want to give you a miracle when you need it. Right now, if you're not saved, pray this prayer with me. Lord God, I thank you. That is not too late. I thank you for your love. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And because you died, and God with all power in your hand, I am. Say, say this now. I am saved. Jesus is Lord. God bless you. This Pastor Duncan said, join us live on next uh, Wednesday for our Bible study. We're in a fantastic series there that will bless you. But also on June 7th, mark it down, will be the premiere. We're going to have our first parking lot worship service here at our Bible location. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Here's what's going to happen. We want you to drive up, look up, and let the power come down. God's going to bless you. We're just taking the next step. Nothing's going to stop the church. We thank you today. God bless you. Have a great day. I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free What he did.